Greetings in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and uh, welcome to this uh, last of the August message that we have on uh, long suffering and patience. Uh, up to this day, we have touched on uh, various points and also various sub points. In August, as we continue this series uh, for the second month, we have touched on the reason why long suffering and uh, patience is required. And uh, we touch on such things as um, in, in point one, we talk about how whenever you receive a word or a revelation, you need to be prepared that there is persecution, there is a tribulation because of the word's sake. And the purpose of uh, this um, tribulation, the persecution that God allowed to challenge the word and the revelation that God has given is so that we be tested and tried and we go to point number two which is the building of our character and in point number two as we change internally and become stronger and stronger transforming Christ then the external circumstances will change do not expect outward circumstances to change before inward change. You always change on the inside first before you change on the outside. And the target of the change on the inside is to grow, to become more and more Christ-like for that is our ultimate predestination. It is more important to do something in the right way in the spirit of Christ than to do just to do something. We need to be focused on yielding to Christ and allowing the Spirit of Christ to do it through us. For you can spend many days, many weeks and hours on something. But if it's not done out of love, all the effort will be wasted. That is why we need to rethink about what, all that we do. Be in the position of resting God. Yield to God. Die to self. And allow Christ to live through us. And point two will be tremendous in our life. That is why long suffering is for the purpose of building our character, internal character within us. And number three, we speak about God's fullness of time. And that's to encourage us so that some of us think, okay, these two things have happened, the first two points, I uh, passed the test. But even if you pass the first two tests, and you withstand everything and are transformed, there still need to be patience to wait for God's fullness of time. Jesus was perfect. He was ready to do God's work at 12 years old, at 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. But he has to wait exactly for the fullness of time. At the age of 30, God sent him forth. And that's what we need to do, point number three. Point number four. There is progression of different levels and there are different levels of progression of glory, different progressions of progressions in faith and different progressions in long suffering and in suffering for Christ and uh, some of the suffering is not necessarily self uh, inflicted by others but some of the suffering is that we have to choose to sacrifice in order to progress to the next level to allow pruning to take place in our life so that we can bear more fruit. And those are God's personal leadings in our life. And we spoke about that at how that during the pruning stage, it is not an easy decision. Like if God called you to be a missionary, do you think it's easy to live your life of luxury and then go to live in a third world country? where a lot of facilities and things that you're used to or conveniences you're used to and don't exist. But when you choose to do that, there is a measure of suffering. Just like the Apostle Paul, at any moment he could quit the ministry and stop serving Jesus. But because he keeps choosing to serve Jesus, he went through all those things that you see him go through in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He really suffered. But the suffering, he had a choice. It was not a suffering without choice. At any time, if he stopped doing God's will or preaching the gospel, he would not suffer all the things he suffered. So it's a choice that has to be made. 
and and God is a loving God who without fear or favor. So sometimes we don't realize it, but when we go back to heaven, we will sometimes realize, wow, this person got so much reward, that person got so much reward. And it is not just because of predestination. Yes, predestination is a part of it, but whatever role, whatever call God has, there are also levels of suffering. And as you choose to sacrifice and suffer, even at whatever calling that is not so public, a calling that is very private, it could be like nurturing uh, children, it could be nurturing uh, and being a support to men and women of God, working in the background. Whatever level, there is always that level of progressive suffering and sacrifice required. And until we are like Jesus, we are willing to sacrifice everything to fulfill and do God's perfect will. There is levels of sacrifice. Just like the rich young man, he had a choice to move on. Don't you think that it will be a suffering for him to give up everything that he had, give up all the accumulation of wealth, give up all his comfort, give up his um, uh, ease of, uh, of wealth and, and everything, conveniences that he had, and follow Jesus? Of course, there's an element of suffering. And the good thing is, it is free choice. You think that all sufferings is, is uh, without choice? It is free choice. When you exercise your free choice to go from one level to another, God will always ask, do you want to go through? You might not hear the exact sentence, do you want, but you will be aware that there is a free choice. And it's up to you. God says you can remain as you are at that level of glory and suffering that you have already achieved. But one thing thou lackest, if you really, really want the next level, are you willing to sacrifice and suffer? Do you want to choose that road, the road of the cross, to go deeper into the cross so they can higher resurrection life and to know our Lord even more? That will be a choice. And I found that many people, because of a lack of teaching, and for a lack of vision of life to come, do not choose a road of suffering. They think they got enough suffering, and they dare not choose, and do not choose, do not know how to tap on the grace of God to go forth, to achieve and to receive greater rewards in heaven. And so they stop. They rather grow in other areas, but they stop in their growth of the fellowship of the sufferings of our Lord Jesus. If you truly want to be fully transformed with great rewards in heaven, the road or the fellowship of the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ is always open to you. But it will demand sacrifices, sacrifices and pruning, which when you're being pruned, you will feel the pain, you will feel the sacrifice. By the end of the day, no sacrifice is greater than the sacrifice our Lord Jesus Christ did for us. And no sacrifice is equal to the greatness of the rewards and blessings that God has in store for each sacrifice. After you understand this truth, you will truly know that whatever we give up, whatever we sacrifice, is nothing compared to the greatness of the reward that God truly blesses with. So choose you this day to what level and how close you are in the walk with our Lord Jesus and with our Father God. And I want to be blunt with you that that road is a road of suffering in this life. And if you're willing to take it, then you can go far in the Lord. And that is possible because, in number five, you understand the doctrine of suffering. You understand that Suffering is a privilege and not a curse. It's a blessing and not a curse. It's a privilege and not a uh, low, uh, uh, low requirement. It's only for those who are privileged that God will give you the blessing to suffer for Him.
So meditate through these words that we have spoken and of all the series that is important for us to comprehend, this teaching on suffering is vital and very important to the progress that we need to flow forth in our lives. So hearken unto it, listen over and over again until you understand this message of long suffering and patience. Now we move to another thing altogether and that is um, we want to speak about absolute I call it absolute word and when pondering and praying through this message there are many titles that I thought I could give this message it could be like absence of fear uh, it could be um, uh, absolute power in God it would be absolute faith fullness of faith but in the end because everything is about the word and how much of the word enters into our life and transform our DNA I've chosen to call it absolute word what is absolute word the Bible has over and over again reminded us in many many ways how the word of God created us and it is the life force and the foundational uh, foundational forces or reality of our existence God made the whole universe through his word and the substance of his word is that we sustain this life so God speaks and says man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God that our very existence is nourished and filled with the word of God and let me take some simple Bible examples to show forth let's start from the book of Job in terms of suffering and um, in the things of this life and Job remember exists before Abraham so the, he doesn't have a written word the written word only came forth even Abraham did not have a written word the written word only came forth in the time of Moses but God did speak to people as he does now and in God's mercy today for those without the word he continued to speak to them through, through visions and dreams and various manners uh, once you have the word that is an additional and the main way which God speaks to you through written word but he continues to to uh, embellish his uh, speaking and his dialogue in our life with visions and revelations but the word is still the basis of all things in the book of Job we see at the beginning of the book of Job that now that we understand that um, suffering is a privilege and understanding this doctrine of suffering you will understand that when God was sort of if you can say quote unquote showing off Job in the sense that he is so impressed with Job and Job's relationship with him that he would be willing to challenge the devil to the fact that Job will remain with him even if he has nothing and all of us know the background of this story but for the sake of those who are not very familiar with the book of Job or, or with some details then uh, let's consider that in Job chapter 1 it says here and any message on long suffering and patience need to be able to touch on the book of Job because Job was uh, sort of became every man of God is uh, presented in the Bible as a particular strength like uh, Elijah the prophet of miracles Daniel the prophet of wisdom uh, and then you have uh, Moses uh, or which represent the personification of the law within himself and then you have Abraham faith with Job it is patience with Job it is patience and uh, Job is mentioned 
uh, here in the Bible. Let's have the occurrences. I just put joke there. And, huh. Okay, I need to find out what's wrong with this. Job, okay, search. Ah, okay. Job, 10 occurrences. Uh, Job, there you go. Okay. Job is mentioned in the book of James. And let's go to that. James chapter 5 verse 11. says here. In verse uh, 11, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job. The word perseverance here is the word hupomone, one of the words uh, for patience. They are macrotumia, but it's hupomone, so it, it should be translated patience. You have heard of the patience of Job, and seen the end intended by God, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So Job, whose story is way before Abraham, became the story of the virtue of patience. Not faith, but of patience. Let's look at the book of Job with the background from last week's teaching on the doctrine of suffering to accept that God actually give free choice. You must be very clear in that. Between the different levels of suffering that a person go through, God will not put you or test you and allow you to be tested and tried beyond what you're able. But with each level that God allows you to be tested, you would have a free choice. Just like Jesus had a free choice whether he wanted to go to the wilderness or not. Jesus had a free choice whether he wanted to go to the cross. At all times, we will be given a free choice. And if we choose no, uh, then whatever rewards or tasks or the will of God is to be performed in the particular area of which we were given the first choice will be given to another man or another woman. Because God's will will always be done. And you can be sure, God will always find the man or the woman that he wants to fulfill his plan. And when one says no, there will be others. It's just like when Jesus called people to follow him. They have a free choice to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus and be his disciples uh, might mean that the Sanhedrin Council might ostracize you. So to follow Jesus, that's a price. And just like I also know that uh, in this move, as we receive various persecutions, uh, when people choose to follow, you will also receive a flag and uh, ostracization and uh, persecution. But the main thing is that you need to know who or what you follow. You have a free choice. And uh, no one is compelled to do anything. And um, we also have our basic uh, belief system, of which you can see that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, uh, fullness of God, uh, fully man, fully God, and there's no salvation except through our Lord Jesus Christ and through what Jesus has done on the cross. So we are basic evangelical. And uh, we have a view, various views on the end times, but they are just prophecies standing by, by themselves. And these messages are given free. We have not charged any money for any of the messages. And uh, for books, in future when we print, of course there's a cost of printing. But since we're able to deliver these messages free online, it's yours. And we also have also given books free online in PDF format. But the physical books will have a console that will have to be bought or uh, perhaps as we begin to sell messages in uh, various form in USB sticks or whatever uh, with notes and accompanying notes in the future, then of course there will be a cost. But otherwise, we give the gospel free, give the word free and uh, so that each one of you can grow in the Lord. And so we praise God for His uh, grace that enables us to do so. Everyone has a choice to choose the suffering at each level. God is merciful. He will not allow you to go through anything beyond what you're able. But I'm amazed at the fact that God does have a choice 
and gave us free choice whether we want to proceed forth or not or remain as we are. The young man, the rich young man who came to Jesus in Mark chapter 10 was given a free choice and it's up to him whether he wants to be a disciple of Jesus, following Jesus wherever, he, wherever Jesus went. Uh, but the cost for him is to sell all and give to the poor and have nothing in his hand. So they can learn to live fully trusting on Jesus, God, the Father and the Word of God. Job is an example that we're going to look at as we, as we see what I call this concept of absolute word, absolute faith or absolute um, triumphant, absolute victory or fearlessness, absence of fear in any life. Let's look at the book of Job. It says here, we have to learn some patience on Job. Now, it says here in chapter 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. So altogether he has ten children, seven sons, three daughters. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So outwardly he was prosperous. And as I say again, this prosperity he had was a side effect of his relationship and his walk with God. He loved God. Says in verse 4, Now I don't know whether his children love God as much as him. And again, that's their free choice. But Job loved God. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day. And would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So the children gathered together. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now Job was not just interested that he himself was following God. He was very concerned that his children would, should not sin or curse God or do anything wrong in the sight of God. Job had a fear of God in his life. And so he did that for every one of his ten children, seven sons and three daughters. Regularly, he offered to God offering, he prayed for them, he interceded. He was truly an example of a good man, blessed by God, spiritually fruitful and physically prosperous. So here we have that one fine day there was something that happened in the spiritual world that was invisible to Job. And he was a subject of a conversation. Remember the Bible says in the heaven that uh, all the angel God you know, all the angels of God will be will, will sort of know you kind of thing. Uh, when you've done something, all the angels of God will rejoice in heaven. So we all do have a certain level of quote unquote known of fame in heaven. And it's important that all of heaven know who you are because of your exploits in God and your close walk with God. It's not very important whether you're famous on this earth. And God forbid in hell. But it's important that God and the angels in heaven know you. That was similar to Daniel who walked close with God. And when Gabriel came to him, always say, Oh Daniel, man beloved by God. So God knows him. I'm sure when Abraham walked with God, God also knows him. It's good to have a good reputation with God and to know God. Walk closely with God. So Job was a subject of this conversation 
and when all the angels were gathered and remember this was before this was way before Abraham and this was in those days when when God has not instituted that um, uh, revelation of uh, faith to Abraham and this was also before Jesus Christ went and destroyed all the powers of the enemy uh, after that the, this, thing, this situation don't exist anymore after Jesus Christ anyway <clears throat> in this situation that we have here in this situation that we have here God spoke to Satan and said have you considered my servant Job now God knew that Job was ready for this God will never put anyone to a situation where they're not ready and so when God said when Satan has gone to and fro this type of conversation does not exist anymore after Christ this is in the Old Testament then the challenge was that Satan accused Job and said he he fear he doesn't fear you for nothing he fear you because you protected him you blessed the work of his hands his possessions increase the land and if you take all these things away he will no longer serve you and love you now why do we consider this point because I have heard at least one time, maybe twice, the words from a man of God. And that time I was uh, just out from seminary and I was just progressing in ministry and I heard from the pulpit and it was a big meeting of thousands of people and this was quite a famous evangelist. He's from Africa and he said that if God did not bless him and do all those things, that he did of course he was like a challenge he would not be serving God and I said oh no this person would not pass the test of Job I mean although you're from Baptist seminary you know enough of the story of Job I said why do people serve God why do people love God this is a question we might ask so that we can understand why there is suffering and by the way what is suffering? How do we define suffering? In this world that we live, suffering involves not receiving what one thing one should receive, affliction or pain, uh, whether it be physical or, or, or so, uh, circumstances of poverty or sickness or disease or everything that we deem today to be under the curse of the law now there is per se a curse of the law that involves poverty sicknesses diseases or all those things that come because of death that came in through adam but god in christ today in the new testament has removed certain things and I believe that God will, based on Psalms 91, protect one from physical harm, physical pain, and physical injury, and from sicknesses and disease because of atonement of Christ. But there are some things that are still there. Like, for example, what causes suffering? Delays cause suffering. When some things that you expect and take so long to come and you suffer, the inconveniences, the pain, and the and all this hunger and tears or or stretching that is required, and so that is to our human life, human world suffering, and then there's the the suffering that's involved by personal choice where you sacrifice all in order to do God's will to preach the gospel like the Apostle Paul. So you want to know why he's suffering? Read Second Corinthians eleven, all the things that Paul went through. Look at what Jesus went, went through. And those sufferings are born out of love. They're not born out of um, uh, lack of free choice. Jesus chose, Paul chose, and we choose. So we need to understand 
that when God deems uh, inconveniences that are multiplied in our life to the extent that it is like suffering, that there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. That God is testing your long suffering and patience. Just like when the Israelites walked through the wilderness, it was very inconvenient. And they have many situations of lack and thirst and various, various dramas that goes on in the wilderness. And it caused them extreme discomfort, pain and suffering. So there is suffering in all those areas. And so God might sometimes allow you in situations where there's slight delay, in situations where there's slight inconveniences, and there's thirst, there's hunger, there's a lack in your life, and you deem it as suffering, but remember, those are only temporary to test what is in your heart. Yes, even if you're fully blessed like Abraham, God still had to test him in Genesis 22 to see whether he loved his son more than God. So God asked him, since I give you your only begotten son, you love your son, I can see that you love your son. But I now want to see whether you love your son more than me. And he asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. That won't happen again, of course, in the New Testament, in Christ, things are different today. But God will ask you to sacrifice your Isaacs, things that God actually bless you with, to see whether you're willing to give up those things. And remember, when God asks you to give up, let's just say, ask the rich man to give up everything that he had. That is suffering. And it's not just theoretical. He actually have to do it. That will cause suffering and pain. And so here the devil's accusation is that Job served God because he was blessed. Now we know that God blessed those who love him. But if for a moment of testing, if for a moment of time, everything around you disappears, would you still love God? I know some of you say, yes. But remember, when Jesus was about to be arrested, captured, and he says all his disciples will run away, Peter says, I will not, I will, I will stay with you. Jesus Christ said that he will deny him three times. Peter was so confident he was willing to die for Jesus. But when it came to the time that he actually could be arrested, like Jesus was, or even gave his life for Jesus, he backed down. So only God knows whether we truly mean what we say. And you will be tested for that. Now, sometimes things did not happen. But God will know whether you're truly willing or not. And he said, please God, don't send me to Africa. God will keep formatting you until you're willing. Then when you're willing, God says, alright, you don't have to go now. That's because I want to make sure you're willing. It's a case of surrenderness. So remember, we thank God for all His blessings. But if at any time his blessings will be held, delayed, just for a moment of time, you need long suffering and patience to see yourself through so that God can even bless you greater. Now, all the suffering started happening to Job. In one day, he lost all his sons. He lost all his property. He lost all the animals. And all he had was just his life. 
And Job arose in verse 20. <clears throat> I mean, think about the torment, the pain, the emotional distress he's going through. He did not lose just one child. He lost all ten children. He did not lose just a little bit of finances. He lost all his finances, which are invested in, in all the animals. Literally, in one foul soup, he lost everything. Verse 20, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshipped. Worship! He worshipped God. And he said, he said something that is true. Naked, I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I know the faith message people are saying, the Lord gave, the Lord never takes away. If that is true, then why did God take ten tribes after Solomon died from David's descendants, from Solomon's son? Was it God who took that away or was it the devil? No, the prophet went and looked for Jeroboam. So that after Solomon died and his son Rehoboam was taking over, no matter what he did, if God take it away, you cannot have it. And so he tried to keep all the ten tribes together, or tried to be like Solomon, and he failed because ten tribes pulled away from him. They pulled away only after the prophet prophesied to Jeroboam. And after tearing twelve pieces of clothing, he tells Jeroboam to take ten because he says, The Lord now give this to you. Of course, Sadly, Jeroboam himself was not faithful. He worshipped false gods. And God actually wanted to establish another kingdom permanently and Jeroboam's descendants and more and descendants would continue having the dynasty if he had obeyed God, like David. But he did not. And all his generation died, including his children. And so in the northern kingdom, there never was any firm dynasty. Uh, God actually promised to establish a dynasty, just like he had established David's dynasty. God took ten tribes and gave it away. So did God take away? I would say, uh, yes, in response as a judgment to sin and disobedience. Because Solomon had sinned and disobeyed God, God reduced him. He didn't fully take away the kingdom because God still kept his promise to, to, to David. But it was God who took ten tribes away and gave it to another man. Now it's up to the other man whether he's faithful or not. Uh, sadly, the story of Jeroboam was he was not faithful. But God did give him ten tribes. And the ten tribes have always, from that day on, served other kings and not the king, a descendant of David. From that day onwards, Israel was divided into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So did God give and God take away? Yes, he did. Of course, it was in response to a judgment. So when God judge, he can take. Let me give you another incident. You remember the story of um, Moses and when Moses started complaining that uh, he didn't give birth to the Israelites, why should he be taking care of them? He said he cannot take it anymore. And then he told God that if 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 God doesn't do anything, he 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 asked God to kill him. Doesn't want to live anymore. That was when God took the spirit that was on him and gave it to seventy elders, and they prophesied. So did God take from him? Yes, Moses had the anointing to govern all the, of Israel. But when his soul came to the extent that he rather died than live, God doesn't want him to die. 
So God said, all right, all right, don't, don't die. I won't kill you. You're asking me to kill you. God says, you choose 70 people, I will take the spirit that I gave you and give it to the 70 so they can do that work on your, on your behalf. So did God give and God take? Yes, he did. And that's always in response to us when we say, Lord, I cannot take it and I cannot do it. So never pray that prayer or cry. You always say, yes, it's difficult, give me more grace. Yes, it's difficult, enlarge me. And I will do God's perfect will. I will choose God's perfect will. And you keep making that choice, God will be pleased. And you will hold on to everything that God has anointed you to be and to do. But it is a fair statement. We all came into this world with nothing. And whatever you took upon yourself in this life, you're going to leave it all behind. The only thing you can take is your relationship with God, your knowledge of God, your growth in God, the character in God that you have developed. That's the only thing you can take with you. So let's not forget what's important in this life. Anyway, is this that is not enough? In a second occasion in chapter 2, God still spoke and said, Look at Job. He has now got nothing, and yet he loves me. And that was where, in chapter 2, Satan challenged God. Verse 4, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. So he said, Job worship you because you bless him. With children, with prosperity, everything. All those got taken away and Job still loved God. I think he's doing well here. Then, in the end, he says, stretch out your hand, touch his bone and flesh, he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord says, okay, I will let you go further, but you cannot kill him. So Satan put sicknesses and disease. You can see God never gives sickness and disease, but he did give the permission. A lot of debate is going on in a faith message that God gave permission because Job gave permission. I mean, yes, to a certain extent, but Job loved God and God would protect him. Except that this was another level of suffering that he knew Job was able to take it. And so when Satan went forth and afflicted Job with horrible boils such that he suffered, he already lost everything. He had no more property. And he's a bankrupt. Lost all his children in one go. Everybody must look at him. This must be a very cursed man. And then, here he is. Now he's with sickness and disease. And everybody probably thought he's going to die of sickness and disease. And of all the signal disease, it gives him balls, which is one of the most painful things. You cannot sit anywhere, you cannot do anything. Because whatever position you are, there is great pain. And even his own wife was so angry at God. Yes, she has anger against God. And she said in verse 9, Do you still hold fast to your integrity to curse God and die? Oh, how terrible. And then he said, You speak as one of the foolish women. Should we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In this, Job did not sin with his lips. But he did curse himself. He, later on, he did curse himself. Later, his friends provoked him and, and accused him of sin, implied sin, accused him of sin, say he has sinned. Supposed to be three of his uh, best friends. And uh, they provoke him because everyone always have their own explanation for what happened. I'm sure when no one's uh, was building the ark and everything was delayed and not according, and no people expect to see the results. Because do you know that no actually employed a lot of people and the people build the ark and um, 
uh, and then they left. They were involved in building up, but never in the salvation that are provided. They just they just were there uh, for whatever reason. They might not believe even in, in, in Noah, but they work for whatever fee or price. So sad, only eight souls went into ark. So in the same way, some people because uh, uh, of the timing of God, and we already said, there's no delay, it's exactly happening. This is the year of, uh, first year, uh, the second set, seven years of famine. Nothing is delayed, everything is exactly as God purpose. Except people are in a hurry to see signs and wonders, in a hurry to see millions of people follow this end time move. What's the hurry? Let's flow along with God's timing. And uh, what is important? To have multitudes of people, miracles, or to have a character change in Him? See, this move is about the things of value to God, not of things of value to man. And we need to continue to progress and follow God and love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, love our neighbors ourselves, and continue doing God's will. So here, Job went through this, and the rest of the book of Job is about his conversation with his friends, and, and he makes him so miserable that Job ended up cursing himself, which was also not good. And uh, then he started asking, why is this thing happening? Why is this thing happening? And remember, we already had the answer to why. The doctrine of suffering tells us that sometimes temporary suffering is permitted so that God knows what is truly in our heart. Take comfort in this, in the story of Job. And that is that Job has these things that he's learning. At the end of the day, when God finally show up in the book of Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. The Lord answer Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this who darkens counsel? By words without knowledge, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Since you all discuss your theology about who I am, what I do. And firstly, when God revealed himself and all his greatness and omnipotence. In chapter 40, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer. And by the way, in heaven, there is a special place and room where God makes his defense. Yes, amazing. Because God is a just God and sometimes we don't understand how God works and what God is doing and we think that God, we think we are more clever than God and we think that God as a just God should not be doing something or should not be permitting something. But there is a place in heaven where God made his defense and there are uh, this uh, group of beings there uh, together with the, with the angels, uh, they are like the elders kind of thing and um, and they make the defense of God and they make all how reasonable God is and bring all the data together, data which none of us even have, data of person's uh, life before, after, everything, every word spoken, every action done, every intention of heart, everything, and show forth that everything that happened in this planet and to any one of us is just and fair and true. There is a place. And anyway, here God confronts Job and says, Who contends with the Almighty? Then Job answered in verse 3, Behold, I am vile. Who shall, what shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice I will proceed no further. Out of this book of Job, we learn a few things. Number one, even when we prosper, it is not because we prosper by our works or by our righteousness. If we prosper, it is still by the grace and the mercy of God. For if God wants to deal with everyone according to our works and righteousness, 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't even deserve one apple, let alone all the prosperity. Yes, indeed, there's a law that says uh, those who walk in righteousness, they will God supply their need. There's a law of sowing and reaping, all that. But remember, we were all born in sin. So the first argument that God shows forth is actually, actually, He does not have to bless the whole world because the world is already cursed when man fell into sin. It is by His grace that He taught man how to offer Him a sacrifice and it was always through the blood that He blessed us. Even when we did not know it was because of Jesus, it was because of Jesus. Grace was working even before Jesus came. When the animal died, first animal that was sacrificed because of Adam and Eve and God clothed them, that represent that we don't deserve anything. Everything we receive in this life is through grace. So no one can come to God and say, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that, I deserve this. That was the argument of Job and his three friends. And so the first realization Job had was, you bless me because you love me and not because I deserve it. You bless me because I receive your grace. Because all the time from the first chapter, we see he was blessed. But all of us, including Job, including his friends, presume and assume that he was blessed because he was a good man. He was blessed because he did the right thing. Remember, when you are born in sin, everything you, you, you do is really also full of sin. It is because of the blood of the animals that represent the blood of the Lamb, that any single one of us is blessed. That was the first truth that God showed. If you are talking about deserving blessings, all have sinned. We are blessed through the blood of the Lamb. In the Old Testament, picture by the blood of animals. And number two, Job, after speaking to God, uh, after speaking to God and repenting, he says, um, Job answered the Lord and say in chapter 42, he says, I know you can do everything and everything, everything. And he says, I have heard you by the hearing the ear. Now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job, number two, had to repent for thinking that his self-righteousness deserves all things. And his friends too. And he says, he's upset and angry at all his friends. Look at verse 7. He said to Eliphaz, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. You have not spoken what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, you take seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job to offer it up as a burnt offering. My servant Job will pray for you. I will accept him and will do you according to your foolishness because you have spoken of me what, uh, not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So his friends also need the blood sacrifice to cover for their foolishness. And so at the end of all the sufferings, we realize that even if God is not involved in a picture, all humans deserve all the things that the enemy has brought because our forefather Adam has given in to Satan and we have become under his domain. But by the grace of God through the bloodline, through the blood sacrifice, in the Old Testament, through this animal sacrifice pointing to Christ, we receive the grace of God. So at the end, in Job chapter 42, says in verse 12, Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke. You count everything is double what he had in chapter 1, verse 13. 
He also had seven sons and three daughters. He had another seven sons and three daughters. Oh, wow. God must have restored his youth too. And in the whole land, there are none more beautiful than all his three daughters. And their father gave them all inheritance among their brothers. Job lived 140 years and saw his children, grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. He was blessed. Now, what was the difference between Job in Job chapter 1 and in Job chapter 42? The first few verses and the last few verses. Of course, I know all of you saw the physical blessings. You see all the animals there, they all double. If we have a 1,000 year oxen before he only 500, 1,000 female donkeys before he 500, 6,000 camels before he 3,000, everything was double. He saw the, his family all got blessed. What was the difference? There is, not just a physical. Many people look at the physical and don't realize the other difference. Number one, Job was no more living in fear. He was no more living in fear of what his children might do or sin. Do you notice that? It, fear has disappeared. He now know God. He was no more living in fear. Number two, he now knows God. He now know God's mercy. He knew that everything he had was by the mercy of God and not by his own works. He knew God more. That's the good news. And of course, all the things he did before, I believe he did. It would be he remained a worshipper of God. So don't just look at the physical prosperity he had. Look at the change. He was now a man without fear. He had gone through the crucible of tests and came out alive and blessed. He was now no longer in fear. He had surrendered all to God. Do you know that the only place where you can truly, truly have fear, well, live without fear, is as the Bible says in 1 John. And we read from 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 onwards. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. See, Job was anxious, tormented all the time by the fear lest his children see, by, by many fears. In fact, in his conversation, he says, the thing that I greatly feared has taken hold of me. But perfect love casts out fear. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Do you notice? Unless you're perfect in love, you will have fear. So, in point number one, how is it that he is now entered a different stage? Because now, at the end of chapter 42, Job loved God more than ever before. Before, with all his prosperity, with all his, his blessings, one thing was missing. He has not met God. When God met him, and he had an encounter with God, that, more than anything, is more valuable than all his sheep, camels, oxen, donkeys. Meeting God, knowing God, is the highest thing. Thousands of years later, there was another man, Paul. He says, I count all things as rubbish in Philippians 3, that I might pursue, number one, the knowledge of Christ, to know Him. 
So he had both men, one Job, one Paul. To know God is the greatest thing ever. And two, they know the goodness of God came because of the grace of Christ. To know His resurrection power, to know His blessings. But not just to know that, to know that it comes by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the mercy of God, our Lord Jesus. And three, both Paul and both Job had suffered. And when they went through the suffering, and you know, actually, after you go through suffering, and you actually embrace it, you are no more afraid of suffering. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12, after being buffeted by the fallen angels, says, he says, he take great pleasure in infirmities. He take great pleasure in suffering. I mean, something changed. When we came into this life, we were afraid of suffering. We are afraid of difficulty. We are afraid of so many things. But after you understand this message of long suffering and patience, and you embrace it, and you go from level to level to level to level, there is a place you enter where you are no more. At first, you you have uh, predict, uh, predict, uh, you know, you you, you predication, uh, uh, now afraid of suffering. Then you got some suffering, you, you embrace it. Then you realize you ask God for grace. Then after some time, you enter a place where Paul enter. You're not afraid of suffering. Then after that, you enjoy the privilege of suffering. You know what it's doing to you. You know what it's cutting out from you. You know what it's pruning out of your life. You take pleasure. And you just want to go through, go through the suffering with great love for God, with great zeal for God. And you know you can pull through to the end. That's the grace and the glory of God. That is absolute surrender, absolute transformation. I still am praying for the what we are bringing forth today. It's full transformation, absolute surrender, absolute fearlessness in the face of suffering. The Lord bless you and cause you to understand this truth, that you may be blessed as Job was, as the Apostle Paul was. In Jesus' name, Amen.